This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 11, 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Chapter 4 The Preparation When the mail got successfully to Dover in the course of the forenoon, the head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door as his custom was. He did it with some flourish of ceremony, for a mail journey from London in winter was an achievement to congratulate an adventurous traveller upon. By that time there was only one adventurous traveller left to be congratulated, for the other two had been set down at their respective roadside destinations. The mildewy inside of the coach, with its damp and dirty straw, its disagreeable smell, and its obscurity, was rather like a larger dog-kennel. Mr. Lorry, the passenger, shaking himself out of it in chains of straw, a tangle of shaggy wrapper, flapping hat, and muddy legs, was rather like a larger sort of dog. "'There will be a packet to Calais to-morrow, drawer?' "'Yes, sir, if the weather holds, and the wind sets tolerable fair. "'The tide'll serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon, sir. "'Bed, sir? I shall not go to bed until night, but I want a bedroom. "'And a barber. And then breakfast, sir. Yes, sir. "'That way, sir, if you please. Show Concord. "'Gentlemen's valise are not wanted to Concord. "'Pull off the gentlemen's boots in Concord. "'You'll find a fine sea-coal fire, sir.' Fetch Barber to Concord. Stir about there now for Concord. The Concord bedchamber being always assigned to a passenger by the mail, and passengers by the mail being always heavily wrapped up from head to foot, the room had the odd interest for the establishment of the Royal George that, although but one kind of man was seen to go into it, all kinds and varieties of men came out of it. Consequently, another drawer, and two porters, and several maids, and the landlady were all loitering, by accident, at the various points of the road between the Concord and the coffee-room, when a gentleman of sixty, formally dressed in a brown suit of clothes, pretty well worn, but very well kept, with large square cuffs and large flaps to the pockets, passed along on his way to his breakfast. The coffee-room had no other occupant that forenoon other than the gentleman in brown. His breakfast-table was drawn before the fire, and he sat with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal. He sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee, and a loud watch ticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat as though it pitted its gravity and longevity against the levity and evanescence of the brisk fire. He had a good leg, and was a little vain of it, for his brown stockings fitted sleek and close, and were of a fine texture. His shoes and buckles, too, though plain, were trim. He wore an odd little sleek, crisp, flaxen wig, setting very close to his head, which wig, it is to be presumed, was made of hair, but which looked far more as though it were spun from filaments of silk or glass. His linen, though not of a fineness in accordance with his stockings, was as white as the tops of the waves that broke upon the neighboring beach, or the specks of sail that glinted in the sunlight far out at sea. A face habitually suppressed and quieted was still lighted up under the quaint wig by a pair of moist bright eyes that it must have cost their owner in years gone by some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Telson's bank. He had a healthy color in his cheeks, and his face, though lined, bore few traces of anxiety but perhaps the confidential bachelor clerks in Telson's bank were principally occupied with the cares of other people, and perhaps second-hand cares, like second-hand clothes, came easily off and on. Completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait, Mr. Lorry dropped off to sleep. 
The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer, as he moved his chair to it, "'I wish accommodation prepared for a young lady who may come here at any time today. She may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lorry, or she may only ask for a gentleman from Telson's Bank. Please to let me know.' "'Yes, sir. Telson's Bank in London, sir?' "'Yes. Yes, sir. We oftentimes the honour to entertain your gentlemen in their travelling backwards and forwards betwixt London and Paris, sir. A vast dealing of travelling, sir, in Telson and Company's house. Yes, we are quite a French house, as well as an English one. Yes, sir. Not much in the habit of travelling yourself, I think, sir. Not in late years. It is fifteen years since we, well, since I came last from France. Indeed, sir, I was before my time here, sir, before our people's time here, sir. The George was in other hands at that time, sir. I believe so. But I could hold a pretty wager, sir, that a house like Telson and Company was flourishing a matter of fifty, not to speak of fifteen years ago. You might say treble that, and say a hundred and fifty, and yet not be far from the truth. Indeed, sir. Rounding his mouth and both his eyes, as he stepped backward from the table, the waiter shifted his napkin from his right arm to his left, dropped into a comfortable attitude, and stood surveying the guest while he ate and drank, as from an observatory or watchtower, according to the immemorial usage of waiters in all ages. When Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little, narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach, and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about, and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town, and thundered at the cliffs, and brought the coast down madly. The air among the houses was of so strong a piscatory flavor that one might have supposed sick fish went up to be dipped into it, as sick people went down to be dipped into the sea. A little fishing was done in the port, and a quantity of strolling about by night and looking seaward, particularly at that times when the tide made and was near flood. Small tradesmen, who did no business whatever, sometimes unaccountably realized large fortunes, and it was remarkable that nobody in the neighborhood could endure a lamplighter. As the day declined into the afternoon and the air, which had been at intervals clear enough to allow the French coast to be seen, became again charged with mist and vapor, Mr. Lorry's thoughts seemed to cloud too. When it was dark, and he sat before the coffee-room fire awaiting his dinner as he had awaited his breakfast, his mind was busily digging, digging, digging in the live red coals. A bottle of good claret after dinner does a digger in the red coals no harm, otherwise then, as it has a tendency to throw him out of work. Mr. Lorry had been idle a long time and had just poured out his last glassful of wine with as complete an appearance of satisfaction as is ever to be found in an elderly gentleman of a fresh complexion who has got to the end of a bottle, when a rattling of wheels came up the narrow street and rumbled into the inn-yard. He set down his glass untouched. "'This is Mademoiselle,' said he. In a very few minutes the waiter came in to announce that Miss Manette had arrived from London and would be happy to see the gentleman from Telson's. So soon. Miss Manette had taken some refreshment on the road and required none then, and was extremely anxious to see the gentleman from Telson's immediately, if it suited his pleasure and convenience. The gentleman from Telson's had nothing left for it but to empty his glass with an air of stolid desperation settle his odd little flaxen wig at his ears, and follow the waiter to Miss Manette's apartment. It was a large, dark room, furnished in a funereal manner with black horsehair and loaded with heavy, dark tables. These had been oiled and oiled until the two tall candles on the table in the middle of the room were gloomily reflected on every leaf, as if they were buried in deep graves of black mahogany, and no light to speak of 
could be expected from them until they were dug out. The obscurity was so difficult to penetrate that Mr. Lorry, picking his way over the well-worn turkey carpet, supposed Miss Manette to be, for the moment, in some adjacent room, until, having got past the two tall candles, he saw, standing to receive him by the table between him and the fire, a young lady of not more than seventeen, in a riding cloak, and still holding her straw travelling hat by its ribbon in her hand. As his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and the forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of rifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder, or alarm, or merely a bright fixed attention though it included all four expressions. As his eyes rested on these things, a sudden vivid likeness passed before him, of a child whom he had held in his arms on a passage across that very channel one cold time, when the hail drifted heavily and the sea ran high. The likeness passed away, like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier-glass behind her, on the frame which a hospital procession of negro cupids, several headless and all cripples, were offering black baskets of dead sea fruit to black divinities of the feminine gender, and he made his formal bow to Miss Manette. "'Pray take a seat, sir,' in a very clear and pleasant young voice, a little foreign in its accent, but a very little indeed." "'I kiss your hand, miss,' said Mr. Lorry, with the manners of an earlier date, as he made his formal bow again, and took his seat. "'I received a letter from the bank, sir, yesterday, informing me that some intelligence or discovery—the word is not material, miss, either word will do—respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw, so long dead—' Mr. Lorry moved in his chair and cast a troubled look toward the hospital procession of negro cupids, as if they had any help for anybody in their absurd baskets. Rendered it necessary that I should go to Paris, there to communicate with the gentleman of the bank so good as to be dispatched to Paris for the purpose. Myself. As I was prepared to hear, sir. She curtsied to him. Young ladies made curtsies these days with a pretty desire to convey to him that she felt how much older and wiser he was than she. He made her another bow. I replied to the bank, sir, that it was considered necessary by those who know that, and who are so kind as to advise me, that I should go to France, and that as I am an orphan and have no friend who could go with me, I should esteem it highly if I might be permitted to place myself during the journey under that worthy gentleman's protection. The gentleman had left London, but I think a messenger was sent after him to beg the favour of his waiting for me here. I was happy, said Mr. Lorry, to be entrusted with the charge. I shall be more happy to execute it. Sir, I thank you indeed. I thank you very gratefully. It was told me by the bank that the gentleman would explain to me the details of the business, and that I must prepare myself to find them of a surprising nature. I have done my best to prepare myself, and I naturally have a strong and eager interest to know what they are. Naturally, said Mr. Lorry. Yes, I... After a pause he added, again settling his crisp flaxen wig at the ears, It is very difficult to begin. He did not begin, but in his indecision met her glance. The young forehead lifted itself into that singular expression, but it was pretty and uncharacteristic besides being singular, and she raised her hand as if with some involuntary action she caught at or stayed some passing shadow. "'Are you quite a stranger to me, sir?' Am I not? Mr. Lorry opened his hands and extended them outwards with an argumentative smile. 
Between the eyebrows and just over the little feminine nose, the line of which was as delicate and fine as it could possibly be, the expression deepened itself as she took her seat thoughtfully in the chair by which she had thitherto remained standing. He watched her as she mused, and the moment she raised her eye again, went on. In your adopted country, I presume, I cannot do better than address you as a young English lady, Miss Manette? If you please, sir. Miss Manette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to equip myself of. In your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I were a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, Miss, the story of one of our customers. Story? He seemed willfully to mistake the word she had repeated, when he added, in a hurry, Yes, customers. In the banking business we usually call our connection our customers. He was a French gentleman, a scientific gentleman, a man of great acquirements, a doctor. Not of Beauvais. Why, yes, of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of repute in Paris. I had the honor of knowing him there. Our relations were business relations, but confidential. I was at that time in our French house, and had been, oh, twenty years. At this time, may I ask, at, at what time, sir? I speak, miss, of twenty years ago. He married, an English lady, and I was one of the trustees. His affairs, like the affairs of many other French gentlemen and French families, were entirely in Telson's hands. In a similar way, I am, or have been, trustee of one or another to scores of our customers. These are mere business relations, miss. There is no friendship in them, no particular interest, nothing like sentiment. I have passed from one to another in the course of my business life, just as I pass from one of our customers to another in the course of my business day. In short, I have no feelings. I am a mere machine. To go on? But this is my father's story, sir. And I begin to think— The curiously roughened forehead was very intent upon him. That when I was left an orphan, through my mother's surviving my father only two years, it was you who brought me to England. I am almost sure it was you. Mr. Lorry took the hesitating little hand that confidently advanced to take his, and he put it with some ceremony to his lips. He then conducted the young lady straight away to the chair again, and, holding the chair back with his left hand, and using his right by turns to rub his chin, pull his wig at the ears, or point what he said stood looking down into her face, while she sat looking up into his. Miss Manette, it was I. And you will see how truly I spoke of myself just now in saying I had no feelings, that all the relationship I hold with my fellow creatures are mere business relations, when you reflect that I have never seen you since. No, you have been a ward of Telson's house since, and I have been busy with the other business of Telson's house since. Feelings? I have no time for them, no chance of them. I pass my whole life, miss, in turning an immense pecuniary mangle. After this odd description of his daily routine of employment, Mr. Lorry flattened his flaxen wig upon his head with both hands, which was most unnecessary, for nothing could be flatter than its shining surface was before, and resumed his former attitude. So far, miss, as you have remarked, this is the story of your regretted father. Now comes the difference. If your father had not died when he did, don't be frightened. How you start? She did indeed start, and she caught his wrists with both her hands. Pray, said Mr. Lorry in a soothing tone, bringing his left hand from back of the chair to lay it upon the supplicatory fingers that clasped him in so violent a tremble, pray control your agitation. A matter of business. As I was saying, her look so decomposed him that he stopped, wandered, and began anew. 
As I was saying, if Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had not suddenly and silently disappeared, if he had not been spirited away, if it had not been difficult to guess to what dreadful place, though no art could trace him, if he had an enemy and some compatriot who could exercise a privilege that I in my own time have known the boldest people afraid to speak of in a whisper across the water there, for instance, the privilege of filling up blank forms for the consignment of any one to the oblivion of a prison for any length of time. If his wife had implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any tidings of him, and all quite in vain, then the history of your father would have been the history of this unfortunate gentleman, the doctor of Beauvais. I entreat you to tell me more, sir. I will. I am going to. Can you bear it? I can bear anything but the uncertainty you leave me in at this moment. You speak collectedly, and you are collected, that's good, though his manner was less satisfied than his words. A matter of business. Regard it as a matter of business, business that must be done. Now, if this doctor's wife, though a lady of great courage and spirit, had suffered so intensively from this cause before her little child was born— the little child was a daughter, sir. A daughter. A, a matter of business. Don't be distressed, miss. If the poor lady had suffered so intently before her little child was born, that she came to the determination of sparing the poor child the inheritance of any part of the agony she had known the pains of, by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead, no, don't kneel. In heaven's name, why should you kneel to me? For the truth. Oh, dear, good, compassionate sir, for the truth. Ah, a matter of business. You confuse me, and how can I transact business if I am confused? Let us be clear-headed. If you could kindly mention now, for instance, what nine times nine pence are, or how many shillings and twenty guineas, it would be so encouraging. I should be so much more at my ease about your state of mind. Without directly answering to this appeal, she sat so still then that, when he had gently raised her, and the hands that had not ceased to clasp his wrists were so much more steady than they had been, that she communicated some reassurance to Mr. Jarvis Lorry. That's right, that's right. Courage, business. You have business before you, useful business. Miss Manette, your mother took this course with you, and when she died, I believe broken-hearted, having never slackened her unavailing search for your father, she left you at two years old to grow to be blooming, beautiful, and happy without the dark cloud upon you of living in uncertainty where your father soon wore his heart out in prison, or wasted there through many lingering years. As he said the words, he looked down with an admiring pity on the flowing golden hair, as if he pictured to himself that it might have been already tinged with grey. You know that your parents had no great possession, and that what they had was secured to your mother and to you. There has been no new discovery of money or any other property, but— He felt his wrist held closer— and he stopped. The expression in the forehead which had so particularly attracted his notice, and which was now immovable, had deepened into one of pain and horror. But he has been, been found. He is alive, greatly changed. It is too probable, almost a wreck. It is possible though we will hope the best, still alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there, I, to identify him, if I can, you to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, comfort. A shiver ran through her frame, and from it through his she said in a low, distinct, awe-stricken voice, as if she were saying it in a dream, I am going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him. 
Mr. Lorry quietly chafed the hands that held his arm. There, 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 see now, see now. The best and the worst are known to you now. You are well on your way to the poor wronged gentleman, and with a fair sea voyage and a fair land journey, you will soon be at his dear side. She repeated in the same tone, sunk to a whisper, I have been free. I have been happy, yet this ghost has never haunted me. Only one thing more, said Mr. Lorry, laying stress upon it as a wholesome means of enforcing her attentions. He has been found under another name, his own long forgotten or long concealed. It would be worse than useless now to inquire which, worse than useless to seek to know whether he has been for years overlooked or always designedly held prisoner. It would be worse than useless now to make any inquiries, because it would be dangerous. Better not to mention the subject, anywhere or in any way, and to remove him, for a while at all events, out of France. Even I, safe as an Englishman, and even Telson's, important as they are to French credit, avoid all naming of the matter. I carry about me not a scrap of writing openly referring to it. This is a secret service altogether. My credentials, entries, and memoranda are all comprehended in the one line, Recalled to life, which may mean anything. But what is the matter? She doesn't notice a word. Miss Manette! Perfectly still and silent, not even fallen back in her chair, she sat under his hand, utterly insensible, with her eyes open and fixed upon him, and with that last expression looking as if were carved or branded on her forehead. So close was her hold upon his arm that he feared to detach himself lest he should hurt her. Therefore he called out loudly for assistance without moving. A wild-looking woman, whom even in his agitation Mr. Lorry observed to be all of a red color, and to have red hair, and to be dressed in some extraordinarily tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet, like a grenadier wooden measure, and good measure, too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the inn-servants, and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. "'I really think this must be a man,' was Mr. Lorry's breathless reflection, simultaneously with his coming up against the wall. "'Why, look at you all!' bawled this figure, addressing the inn-servants. "'Why don't you go and fetch things instead of standing there staring at me? "'I am not so much to look at, am I? "'Why not you go and fetch the thing? "'I'll let you know if you don't bring smelling salts, cold water, and vinegar. "'Quick, I will!' "'There was an immediate dispersal for these restoratives, "'and she softly laid the patient on a sofa, "'and tended her with great skill and gentleness, "'calling her, "'My precious and my bird, and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders with great pride and care. "'And you in brown,' she said indignantly, turning to Mr. Lorry. "'Couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Look at her, with a pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker?' Mr. Lorry was so exceedingly disconcerted by a question so hard to answer, that he could only look on, at a distance, with much feebler sympathy and humility, while the strong woman, having banished the inn-servants under the mysterious penalty of letting them know, something not mentioned if they stayed there, staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations, and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. "'I hope she will be well now,' said Mr. Lorry. No thanks to you in brown, if she does, my darling pretty. I hope, said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, that you accompany Miss Manette to France. A likely thing, too, replied the young woman. If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot up on an island? This being another question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it.
Thus ends chapter 4, The Preparation.